Today we're going to be talking about cache memory. A cache is a small, fast memory which is transparent to the processor. The reason it's in the system is because it's a lot faster than main memory, although it's smaller. There's, there's a trade-off between size and speed of access. The cache duplicates information that's in main memory, and each cache, each data block in the cache, has an associated identifier or tag. Now the blocks can be of varying size. They'll probably be at least several words large. They're probably not going to be more than about 256 bytes large. In fact, 128 or 256 bytes are the largest, are, are, the, are the most common sizes. Um, each uh, cache block in the cache uh, is, has a tag associated with it. And the tag is what's used to look up information in the cache. So at any point, a uh, block will either be in the cache or not in the cache. And if it's in the cache, then its uh, block number in main memory will be held in the tag field. More on that in a moment. So caches are smaller and faster than main memory. And you see that secondary storage on the other end of the spectrum is, fat, is larger and slower than main memory. So you get what you pay for. If you have a fast memory, it has to be small. If you want a large memory, it has to be relatively slow. Now, if you have studied operating systems, you know that if a page isn't in main memory, when it's referenced, you get a page fault. If you look for a word that's not in the cache, you get something analogous called a cache miss. But the difference between a cache miss and a page fault is that a page fault can be handled by software because uh, it doesn't occur very frequently, but a cache miss occurs very frequently, maybe once every 10 instructions. So it needs to be handled very rapidly. Thus, cache misses are handled by hardware. Now, when we talk about cache organization, there's a spectrum. There's, uh, on one end, we have direct mapped caches, which are the easiest to build, but have the lowest hit rate for a cache of a given size. And on the other end of the spectrum are fully associative caches, which are very expensive. In fact, probably uh, impossibly expensive to build. But if you could build them, they'd have a higher hit rate. There are two compromises between those two extremes. One are set associative caches, which we will be talking about in a later video today. And then there are sectored caches, which are also important, have been important in various times in the history of our computer architecture, but we're not going to consider them in this class. OK, so a cache stores information that can be accessed more quickly than you could get it from main memory. So in order to do that, a cache needs to implement one of several different policies for retrieving and storing information. I know that this is probably a little bit confusing at the start, but bear with me and it'll become clear in time. The first, the first kind of policy is a placement policy that determines where the block is placed when it's brought into the cache. So uh, the blocks that are held in a cache are held in a set of of um, containers, let's call them that, called cache lines. And the cache lines are analogous to page frames in the virtual memory. Well, if you have uh, one placement policy, uh, let's say the direct map placement policy, then a cache block can be placed in only one line when it's brought into the cache. So you don't have any flexibility in where you put it. On the other hand, if you have a fully associative cache, you have a lot of flexibility about where you place a block when it's brought into the cache. Then there's the replacement policy that determines what information is purged when space is needed for a new entry. So suppose that I have a uh, word that needs to be referenced. It's not in the cache, but the cache is full. Which line do we throw out of the cache, or which block do we throw out of the cache so we can bring in the new information? That's determined by the placement policy. And then the third policy is the right policy that determines how soon information that's in the cache is written to lower levels of memory. So let's think about it this way. 
uh, we have a choice about when we write to the cache. We could also write to main memory at the same time, and there are advantages to doing that in certain architectures, especially in parallel architectures, but on the other hand, that's very expensive, so we might defer the write to main memory until, let's say, the, some later time, or maybe even the latest possible time that we can, right before the block is going to be thrown out of the cache. So that's what the write policy determines. If we give uh, three policies, if we specify three policies, the placement policy, the replacement policy, and the write policy, we can tell a lot about a, how a cache is organized. Well, we're now going to talk about cache memory organization. There are several kinds of cache memory organizations, and in this video, we're going to finish up by telling you about one of them. When information is moved into and out of the cache, it's moved out into and out in units called a block. And like I told you, these are usually, let's say, 64 to 256 bytes long, usually 128 or 256 bytes long. Um, and the reason that you bring in more than one byte at a time is because you want to take advantage of locality in programs. When you reference a word of a program, a, a word from a program, you're likely to reference the words right around it. For example, if you're walking through an array and you reference array sub 1, then it's very likely that at some point not in the too distant future, you're also going to reference array 2. So that's the kind of locality that we're taking advantage of. If you bring in one word in the cache, or, or let's say one set of bytes, let's say four bytes is a word, or eight bytes is a word. If you bring in one word, you'll also bring in several adjacent words on the, ch on the, on the good chance that they might be referenced in the near future. So that's one reason that we bring in information in blocks. And another reason is because memory may be organized so that it can overlap transfers of several words at a time. And that's called interleaved memory. We can start accessing, let's say, word 1. And then while word 1 is just getting started, we can start accessing word 2. And so we can overlap the transfers of many words at a time, let's say, 8 words if it's 8-way interleaved. And that enables us to complete the access of the whole cache line in much less time than it would take if we had to access it word by word. Um, I've talked about cache lines as being where you put the blocks when they're in the cache. The block size has to be the same as the line size in the cache. That's just the way caches are built. Um, okay, so let's talk about the policies. The placement policy determines where a particular block can be placed when it goes into the cache. For example, is a block of memory eligible to be placed in any line in the cache? Or is it restricted to a single line? Now, if you're familiar with virtual memory, you know that when a page is brought into main memory, it can be placed in any page frame. And if that's the case with a cache, then we'd have a fully associative cache. But I told you those are very expensive to build, so more likely we have a very restricted limit, a very restricted set of places, a very restricted set of lines that we can place the block into when it's brought into the cache. Well, all of our examples are going to assume that the cache contains 2,048 words. Now that's unrealistically small, but it does make the arithmetic easier. You know, we can do mental calculations more quickly. And then I'll have some examples that, that deal with pretty large addresses, uh, even though the cache itself is small. But the cache, let's say, contains 2,048 words, and it has 16 words per line. Now, you can do the division and tell how many lines it has, so I'll pause for a moment and let you do it. Okay, notice that 2048 is 2 to the 11th, and 16 is 2 to the 4th. So if you divide 16 into 2048, the answer is going to be 2 to the 7th, or 256 lines. Okay, is that right? 2 to the 11th divided by 2 to the 4th is 2 to the 7th? That's right, but 2 to the 7th is 128. So it's 128 lines that we have in the cache. Main memory is made up of 256 K words in our example, or 16,384 16, blocks. Thus, an address consists of how many bits? Well, if it's 256 K words, remember that a K is 2 to the 10th. 
So that means it's 256 times 2 to the 10th. And 256 is, well, it's twice the number that we saw before. It's twice 2 to the 7th. So that means it's 2 to the 8th. And that means that our address consists of 18 bits. We have 2 to the 8th words. OK. Well, I've talked about a hit ratio being the measure of how effective a cache is in speeding up memory accesses. You'd like to have most of the references, in fact, the vast majority of references, hit in the cache. And that means you're trying to structure the cache to have a high hit ratio. A hit means the referenced information is in the cache, whereas a miss is the opposite. It means the referenced information is not in cache and needs to be read in from the main memory. So hit ratio is defined as the number of hits divided by the total number of references. So let's say you have 50 hits and 60 references. Then your hit ratio is 50 over 60 or 5 over 6 or 83%, which isn't too great. You should aim for at least 90% as a hit ratio. OK, so that's what hit ratio means. And we're going to talk about caches that have uh, three different placement policies. So let's start off by talking about direct mapped caches. In a direct mapped cache, we have only one choice of where to place a block. When we bring in block I, we need to place it in line I mod 128. And the reason we make that restriction is because it simplifies the design of the cache as we'll see in a moment. Each line, of course, has its own tag associated with it. And when the line is in use, the tag contains the high order 7 bits of the main memory address of the block. Now, why is it the high order 7 bits? Well, um, notice that our address is Actually, let's, let's, let's defer that until we talk a little bit more about the design, about the uh, breakdown of an address field, because I think it'll be easier to see. So we start off with the offset field. Now, the offset field tells us where in a block or where in a line a particular word is located. And we said that our cache had 16 words per line. And that means that four bits will tell us which word the cache is in. If you, if you prefer, you can think of this as bytes. So just substitute bytes for words wherever I say words, and you get the same calculations. But there are four bits, then, in the offset, because there are 16 words per line. And our address needs to, needs to tell us which word in the line that is. OK? Now, there are 128 lines in the cache. The middle field in the main memory address, so when we, when we talk about a cache, that tells us that we can break down this main memory address, this physical address, into three different fields. The offset field tells us where in the block or where in the line the requested word or byte is located. The index field tells us which line the block goes into. That's the middle seven bits of the address because we have only one choice. So the index field specifies exactly one line that we could possibly place that, uh, that block in. And then, after we take out the index, which is 7 bits wide, because there are 2 to the 7th lines, it's 128 lines, after we take out the offset field and the index field, out of our original 18-bit address, we have 7 bits left. And that's where we get that the tag is 7 bits wide. Now, it's easy in a direct map cache to search for a word. All you do is determine which line to look in, given the main memory address. You look in whatever line that midi the middle 7 bits specify. And you just need to compare the leading 7 bits of the address, the tag field, with the, uh, with the value of the tag in that line. And if it matches, that, that uh, line contains the block you're looking for, so it is a hit. And if it doesn't match, it's a miss. So assuming it's a hit, all you have to do is select the desired word from that line. The disadvantage, or the advantages of this structure, are that 
there's fast lookup because when, for any given address, you only need to look at one place in the cache. The hardware is relatively inexpensive because you only need to build comparison logic for a single tag. And it's also easy to decide where to, build, where to place a block. You don't need a lo complicated logic because you know that any particular block can go in only one line. But direct map caches aren't perfect. And the reason is because that inflexibility in where you can put a block in the cache leads to contention for cache lines. Lots of times you'll have an algorithm that goes around and, you know, and accesses arrays at a constant stride. And if that stride is just a multiple of the cache size, then every access is going to hit the same line in the cache. And there's going to be a massive miss ratio, which is the opposite of the hit ratio. So that's the disadvantage. Okay? Next time we'll talk about a different cache structure. In today's quizzes, all of your answers should be given as ordered triples, or if only two numbers are called for, as ordered pairs. For example, if I ask you for the size of the tag index and offset fields, in the example above, they would be 7, 7, 4.